So the first question is, from the perspective of each, from each of your own spiritual traditions, what do you believe is the most important thing that the Tibetan people have contributed to the dialogue between religions over the past 50 years? Do you want to start with that one? Well, I think His Holiness has um, given the leadership in bringing together um, the uh, leaders and people from many faith traditions. Um, he's on the Peace Council, uh, uh, which brings together people of all the different faith traditions uh, and reminds us that, yes, we have different faiths, but we also have a great deal in common and also articulates the fact that we can work together on certain issues and not get bogged down on the minutiae of the different religions. But we are faced with enormous problems uh, like poverty in the world uh, and for the need for the faith traditions to give spiritual leadership in the world. So that, that has been a tremendous contribution and I'm, I'm honoured to be on the Peace Council with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Bishop Tutu and leaders from the Muslim and the Christian uh, and the Jewish and the Hindu faith, faith. And it's just wonderful to see that they can come together and dialogue on important issues facing the human family. I think that's a great contribution that His Holiness has made to the world. Of course, wherever I go, I always uh, have two commitments. Number one commitment is promotion of human value, or human compassion, and with that, forgiveness, tolerance, these automatically come. Uh, once you have genuine, deep respect of other as a human brother, sisters, then naturally some different opinions, different sort of views uh, you must respect. Uh, and also the other side also, see, because of human being, because of human intelligence, there are also some certain sort of sufficient reasons. Uh, and then one reality, there's many different aspects. So other one, you see, looking from different aspects, so which uh, you may not sort of pay much attention. So therefore, listen to others' different view is very, very helpful to know or uh, your own sort of understanding about the reality. Uh, so that's number one, my commitment. Number two commitment is the uh, promotion of religious harmony. So in this respect, uh, uh, it seems that I made some contribution. So at least, you see, among uh, the major institution, Christianity and Judaism and uh, some Muslim also. You see, now uh, uh, there are, I think, among my friends, there are people who really accept Buddhism uh, as something. Uh, a good religion. <laughs> Otherwise, some people, some sort of very narrow-minded sort of uh, orthodox sort of religious people. So I heard recently uh, in America, I heard this one uh, orthodox sort of, I think, uh, uh, Christian. You see, of course, understandable. When I heard that, oh, of course, of course, this is, it is very possible. So that person is expressed the, because quite often visit by Dalai Lama. So now Dalai Lama uh, leading more people to hell. Wow. <laughs> it's perfectly understandable, you see. Huh. There you see the problem is to say concept of one truth, one religion. Then uh, of course, the uh, other side, you see, look, other, other religion is uh, sort of dangerous, isn't it? Uh, so we depend also, you see, in the, in the, in the previous time, you see, in, I think, beginning of the 20th century, so some Christian, Christian missionaries, workers used to come there, you see, oh, Tibetan, many, quite a number of Tibetans say, oh, this is dangerous. 
So they're similar, you see, lack of understanding, lack of awareness about the value of other. Uh, so I think that, that respect uh, was really, uh, becoming more closer sort of uh, friendship and through that way, uh, deeper understanding about other value. So as I mentioned earlier, Buddhism also quite good religion, that kind, that kind of something. <laughs> then I myself, of course, as a result of more acquaintance with a practitioner, mainly as a practitioner, the Christian, some Jews, some Muslims, uh, as a result, deep admiration from my part. I really appreciate. And for Christian, Christianity is concerned, I think among these major tradition, I think Christianity, I think made maximum contribution for education, whole, this whole planet. Sometimes they also try to convert it. <laughs> that, that's a little bit sort of uh, different, <laughs> different matter. <laughs> different matter. That also, you see, I think largely, you see, due to the local people. Uh, if the local people themselves, you see, uh, sufficient sort of knowledge about their own tradition, then the conversion is difficult. Conversion is not sorry, not that much serious. You see, they have their own sort of as a principle, their own sort of sort of what's the uh, what's the tradition. So like that. So so therefore, uh, 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 I really feel, uh, and then quite a number of occasion, uh, uh, a different country. You see, the uh, concerned organizer who used to make, uh, who made my sort of visit, uh, these usually you see, make uh, interfaith service. So quite a number of occasions uh, I heard, you see, when you see people from different because of denomination, denomination, even within Christian, you see, they introduced each other, then they mentioned their first, their first meeting, because of my presence, because of interfaith, due to Dalai Lama, they had the opportunity meeting themselves, meeting uh, meeting among themselves. Oh, usually, you see, that seem, that means, you see, usually, no, no, sort of, no meeting, oh, no contact, so like that. So, uh, in that respect, I made some, some contribution, little contribution. Could I add a little bit about your contribution? You also in, have accepted the inclusion of secular people, like myself. Um, I always feel like I have to be the voice for those who do not practice a particular faith. Uh, I was raised Catholic, but no longer believe in Catholicism, and, but accept the values of compassion and truth. And I was very pleased to hear you speaking a lot in Vancouver about compassion and secularism and it didn't necessarily have to be a, a faith. And I think one problem that we see in the world sometimes when we're talking about interfaith dialogue and, and, and tolerance and acceptance is somehow leaving out those of us who don't necessarily practice an institutionalized religion. And I've been extremely appreciative personally that you have opened the discussion beyond just the institutional religions because many of us have different ways of expressing faith and spirituality that don't fall within religious boundaries. Just similar to some of our friends who always talk, talk about women as being mothers of the planet and I'm like, I chose not to have babies. so. You know, some of us make other choices, but we also want to be included. So I appreciate the contribution you've made of accepting those of us who are a little bit heathenist. Yes, sir. Heathenist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, I think, in in real sense, uh, I think quite a big portion, if not majority, of the six billion human beings I think in real sense, I think not much serious belief about their own religion. <laughs> now, I think the clear example, clear indication is 
the people talks you see their peace or nonviolence these things or god god fearing these things but actual sort of work actual sort of life don't care these things so that means these people are not very serious about their own religion so therefore i think in a real sense i think quite a big portion of the humanity non believer uh, meantime these are a part of the 6 million human being and uh, and individually they also want uh, peace in a uh, peace through in a peace so they also is want uh, if there is way to as a to bring in a peace without religion the i think many of them i think need that usually is so one i think the problem is uh, some my religious friend spiritual brothers also you see have the view the moral ethics must be based on religious faith then uh, the problems mm. unless you accept religion uh, no basis of moral ethics then how to bring these people to see the sort of what should they conviction moral ethics is basis of our meaningful life uh, we must find ways and means without religion we human being we born uh, from mother and we grown up uh, maximum mothers as a care mothers affection with mothers milk so that really because of the seed seeds of the implant seed of compassion so we even those non believer even i think any religious people if someone show genuine affection they will appreciate isn't it hmm? so so the secular way of approach a secular does not mean we are rejection of religion respect all religion but meantime uh, uh also you see respect non believers non believers also you see part of humanity our brothers among our brothers sisters not only believer huh oh. huh let us work together bring more happier world so secular is very very important secularism very important so secular way of approach is something like more universal if moral ethics based on religion then cannot be universal eh holinos secular dar zamine siyaset manay digari ham dare va un judai din az hukumat secular in the political world has also another meaning which means the separation of religion and government hukumat hay dini این مشکل بزرگ رو دارن که همه چیز رو میخوان با یک قواعد از پیش ساخته شده حل کنن. The problem with religious governments is that they want to resolve everything with laws that have been predetermined. و بدین جهت حکومت های که بر مبنای ایدئولوژی بنا میشن آخرش به استبداد میرسن. and that is why governments that are based on ideology end up despotic totalitarian 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 because the opinion of the people does not matter it is the ideology of the government that has become important um va shoma rahbar dini mazhabi hastid ke nishun dadid ke hukumat mazhabi mitavanat demokrat ham bashad you are a religious leader and you have shown that a religious rule can also be democratic va in برای من بسیار جالب بود وقتی که شنیدم از سال 2001 شما نخست وزیر رو با رأی مردم 
مردم تبت انتخاب کردید It was very interesting for me to hear that since 2001 you have had an elected government and you have an elected prime minister with the votes of the people و در حقیقت اهمیت شما برای جهان از این جهت که شما نشون دادید که حکومت های دینی اگر درست فکر کنند میتونن دموکرات هم باشد So your importance to the world is that you have demonstrated that religious uh, leaders and governments, if they work well, if their conduct is good, they could also be democratic. و اگر دموکرات نیستند به این دلیل که کسانی که در رأس حکومت هستند اینها خودشون دیکتاتوره. And the reason they're not democratic is because those who are at the helm or the leaders are not democratic themselves. و این مفهوم جدید از حکومت مذهبی برای من خیلی جالب بود. So it was very interesting for me to see this new concept of theocracy, religious government. If you want to know the Uh, some something say uh, about the background uh, 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 in Buddhist tradition. Uh, firstly, in, in basically, the Buddha gives same right, male, female, the highest ordination uh, to both male and female. Uh, then, uh, of course, you see the. When you see uh, uh, same sort of highest ordained sort of uh, men and women come together, then male uh, first, female next. So little sort of I say, discrimination. Uh, but basically, it's same equal right. Uh, then, you know, the uh, some sort of conduct. Monastic, sorry, monastic conduct. Uh, see, no, no single monk have the authority. Only sangha or group of monk have the sort of authority, final decision. Uh, so something democratic principle there. So in any way, from the religious view, religious sort of background, whether they, or they agree or not, in the today's reality, uh, we must follow democratic way. Uh, uh, that is the best way to serve, to give uh, the maximum satisfaction to the people. After all, uh, after all, country, any country belongs to the people, not the government. Suppose the government is service, servant of the people. So ultimate sort of voice must uh, in, in the so in, in hand of people. So democratic system is the best way to listen to other sort of wish. I hope that other religious leaders will also learn from you. Oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I, would... I, I have to learn from, from, from others. <laughs> well, I, I would love to see His Holiness the Pope and Pope Benedict in conversation because I come from a Catholic tradition and I'm afraid within the Catholic tradition we really need a reformation because it is a very male-dominated authoritarian uh, from the top down. It's not in the least democratic. <laughs> and I, I think it's, it's very sad that even today, as we move towards uh, democracy and equality between men and women, that within the Catholic Church there is no debate uh, with regard to the role of women uh, ordained uh, priests. Uh, I mean, I, some friends of mine Uh, would like to be uh, ordained into the priesthood uh, and uh, there is just no movement, no discussion at all on that. 
together with very many areas. So I think that our institutions uh, um, need to, to be, look, we're now in the 21st century and we need to move forward for reform and for change. Uh, so, I mean, as a, a committed Catholic, I would love to see uh, <laughs> the attitude that His Holiness has of openness, dialogue and listening and respect and equality within uh, many of our, our organisations. So, do you, will you go and see His Holiness the Pope and have a wee word in his ear? <laughs> <laughs> of, co of course. Uh, uh, it is always now, I say, happy to meet religious leader, and particularly the Pope, uh, a new Pope. Of course, I already met. Uh, and then the previous one, of course, a very, very close sort of spiritual, sort of, uh, spiritual brother. Oh, really wonderful, really wonderful. Uh, however, the certain sort of the practice or certain tradition of different religion, then uh, uh, I should be very strictly neutral. <laughs> oh, if I use the in, uh, intervene, yeah. that's not good. No, not I good. understand, Your Holiness. <laughs> if other religious people you see, intervene about Buddhism, then we feel a little uncomfortable. So similarly, if I intervene, it's their faith, their sort of tradition, that's not good. That's not my right. Uh, uh, so the, the certain sort of kasa thingy, modification of kasa. Modification, or you, you use one, one word, you say some, some change. You mentioned it's some change necessary. Yeah. So that, uh, that should be uh, initiated by, like you, the Catholic <laughs> practitioner, not, not from me. <laughs> However, you said, you said recently that you are, you are a feminist monk. Oh. Maybe, maybe if you meet the Pope, you could just mention that you're a feminist monk, <laughs> and that would set his mind thinking a little bit. That, that I think first, and firstly, I think if, if I have occasion to visit Thailand or Burma or Sri Lanka, where you see the, you see the, uh, you see the, the Buddhist monastic sort of system, very, very sort of well established. So in Thailand, you see, uh, the monk, even if she should not touch a female, and even lay person, you see, if lay person is to show respect, you should not return this way. You should, you should remain like that. So, uh, I think there is a danger. Uh, if I state I'm feminist, oh, and I think they mean dismiss me. <laughs> from from, from Sangha group. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask another question? Uh, when you all look, at, have had a chance now to look at the Tibetan refugee community. Um, so, what do you think is the most important lesson for other refugee groups around the world to learn from, and what can they gain from this Tibetan refugee experience? I don't know. Uh, I think uh, we have very little contact with other refugees, except some Vietnamese from the religious, religious level. We have some connection, some Vietnamese refugee or Cambodian refugee, uh, like that. Uh, but then, uh, the Tibetan, uh, Tibetan refugee settle in different countries, in Switzerland or Canada and also America, uh, uh, of course, Nepal. Uh, and most cases, and India also, the refugee community, Tibetan refugee community's relation with local people, generally very good. Uh, and I received quite a number of sort of, sort of occasion the local Indian officials praising the Tibetan community, the Tibetan refugee community. They are hardworking and disciplined. Sometimes they make sort of comparison, the local tribes. You see, uh, although Tibetan are also quite lazy. So there are some of these tribes even more lazy. So the local sort of officials, you see, very much praising, you see, Tibetan. Uh, 
generally gentle and hard working and more because of that. Humility. Humility. And also in America and also in Canada, the, uh, some of the local people, this is where Tibetan settlement, Tibetan community there, they, of course, basic, uh, occasionally some problems also there. It is quite understandable. But basically, uh, people love Tibetan, generally speaking. So through that, oh, well, I think one, one example, a uh, little contribution uh, regarding ahimsa, nonviolence. Uh, one ex-official who served many years in here, uh, he eventually settled in America. Uh, he, uh, he is working uh, one kitchen of big university. Mm. So he make, uh, his sort of work is cleaning uh, veg vegetable. So uh, while he is cleaning vegetable, whenever he found some insect, he always, you see, put it in a pot. Then later, uh, that sort of uh, bring to somewhere in the soil or some, some vegetation area, you see, release them. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, uh, the, in, in, uh, some of his colleagues, you see, when he used to pick up additional work, isn't it, and put there, so, the, some of his colleagues at the, at, the, uh, at the beginning left a surprise. So they usually is killed. So then later, his colleagues also used to follow his pattern or pick up the insect and put in pot and then later release. So that's one small contribution for practice of nonviolence. <laughs> Quite a number of Chinese, very neutral, and because of the, uh, who looks, the, who visit Tibet and look objectively. And many Chinese appreciate about the Tibetan spirituality, how strong and peaceful, smile, joyful. So some Chinese uh, writers, uh, intellectuals, even is mentioned to me. Uh, in mainland China, uh, last 60 years, the traditional Chinese values now completely disappear. So now only money. So as a result, no moral principle, not uh, the truthfulness. So therefore, a lot of corruptions, a lot of sort of dirty things there. So they are hoping in future, Tibetan can help to revive spirituality among millions of Han people. So there is some potential to serve humanity in a small way. Like that. Well, I, I was very <laughs> impressed uh, here visiting the uh, Tibetan school and the Tibetan community in exile, Your Holiness. And I think what I learned here is the importance of community. I mean, people when people are uprooted from their land and have to go to another land, um, they, they need so much to have that sense of community and people around to care. And we've most certainly seen it here in the Tibetan village and up here in Dar es Salaam. And the world is on the move today, tragically. Uh, because of so much political uh, unrest and because of the environment. There are far more refugees around the world than ever there were. I mean, I go a lot to Israel-Palestine. There are six million Palestinian refugees around the world today. And that's only one example of so many. So I think we have got to look seriously now at this question of refugees. Um, how can they be helped when they are forced out of their country? And uh, how can they be helped, uh, be taken care of, human security for them? They need, they need accommodation, they need home, they need food. So I think the Indian government in hosting the Tibetan people has shown that example of opening up. And instead of, as we're seeing, so many governments are closing their doors now. And indeed, so, uh, uh, people are saying the borders and the walls are 
growing up. They don't want refugees, and we've now environmental refugees now. Bangladesh, the land is sinking because of climate change, mm -hmm. and millions of people yes. will now be refugees looking for a new home. And we have got to really begin to think where we have free land, that we have to be the human family, a one world, and stop this idea of bringing up our borders, and this is our land, and no one's coming in, or this is my job. And again, we really have to look in a completely new way at this uh, movement of people uh, around the world and um, of course deal with the issues like climate change uh, so that people can stay in their homes but look at how governments accommodate people coming from other countries and look at governments where people have been forced out such as China and say well uh, and now in Tibet say well the Tibetan people their homes are here let them come back Palestinians. Palestinians shouldn't have to live in foreign lands. The Israeli government should take seriously the right to return of the Palestinian refugees. So there are many, many challenges there within the whole idea of refugees around the world today. But I do think this is a model here within uh, Dar es Salaam and the rest of India of community, of people building community and trying to live happily in their moment until you know, the, the, the change takes place for them again. It's a huge problem, thank you, thank you. refugees, thank you. Thank you. now for all governments and, and for people. Thank you. Yeah. I have worked with the government a lot of work and I have seen a lot of work. Because of my profession, I have worked with many uh, refugees and I have seen many refugee communities. چیزی که من در اینجا دیدم و بسیار برای من با ارزش بود این بود که اونها اختلاف سیاسی مردم پناهندگان تبت اختلاف سیاسی با هم نداشتند یعنی همه میدونستند که چی میخوان what I saw here and I thought was very valuable for me was that the refugees here do not have any political differences that the better refugees and they know what they want. Whereas among many other political refugees it is not the same case. They have political differences, which has made their situation worse. Bonvan Mesal, bad as Engelab, who do the Chohar million Irani Ahmad Biruna Ziran was in the Yemikoni. For example, since the Islamic Revolution, some four million Iranians have left the country and are living as refugees abroad. که اینها در کشورهای مختلفی هستند همشون هم در یه چیز متحدن و میدونن که جم... مخالف جمهوری اسلامی هستند اما در این که موافق چی هستند با هم اختلاف زیادی دارن they're living in many countries around the world. They're united on one thing, that they're against the Islamic Republic, but they don't know what uh, they, they are in favor of, what they support. And I, unfortunately, in America, I see the second or third in America, they are Iranian, but they can't speak Farsi to the children. Unfortunately, I've come across the second and third generation of refugees in America, and some of their children no longer speak Persian. اهمیتی که جامعه شما اینجا در دارم سال درست کردید این است که پنجاه سال اینا با هم متحدان اتحادشون از بین نرفته و فرهنگ و زبان خودشون حفظ کردند. The importance of what you created here in Dharmasala is that for 50 years they've all been united and they have preserved their culture and their unity and their tradition. As Chin Panohanda Hoy Digari Ham Amadan Birun, Kifarata Batina Budan, Ama Uno Chun Invahtate Tapati Horonadosan, 
اونا متفرق شدن There have been many other refugees out of China and they've gone to various countries but because they haven't had the same sense of unity as the Tibetans they have not had the same success و من بایستی به شما آفرین بگم که توانسته اید هم وحدت تبتی ها رو حفظ بکنید و همین که فرهنگ و زبان اونا رو So I must salute you for having succeeded in preserving the unity of the Tibetans and their language and their culture Thank you <laughs> Could I just make a comment to um, I've been thinking about this quite a bit in terms of the importance too of the host country which you mentioned Mairead it is a big factor that India has been so open to the people of Tibet and obviously as well in Nepal because if they had not been as in so many cases as you have talked about the difficulties of the millions of Palestinians in the world if they don't have acceptance if they aren't offered a new home if they aren't offered the opportunity to educate their people in their culture and their language and if they don't have leadership like you have shown it's very difficult to continue the way you have been able to keep the unity and tradition of the people of Tibet so we commend obviously your leadership but also India and Nepal who have shown such compassion to the Tibetan people I think one thing, uh, spiritually, the Tibetan and Indian, uh, actually, it's the same root. Uh, one time, Indian Prime Minister, uh, Murajit Desai, when he became Prime Minister, uh, I wrote, as usual, sort of congratulation. Then, in his reply, he mentioned two branches of Bodhi tree, same root. He described Tibetan sort of culture, heritage, and India's cultural heritage, same root. So that's why I always say, describe uh, I myself as a son of India, because all my sort of, uh, certain sort of the, uh, I think, way of thinking, uh, uh, the views of the phenomena, these things, uh, all come from India. So all Tibetan spirituality come from India. Uh, and then me personally, last 50 years, since my age 24, now uh, 74. So uh, 50 years, the major portion of my life, and also best part of my life spent in this country. So because of these two reasons, I describe myself as a son of India. So that thousand years, we have very, very unique, close relations. So Tibetans are one of the, I think, faithful disciple of Indian tradition. Although there are many Buddhist countries, but Tibetan case, I think physically also is just uh, next border. Uh, so I think some very, very unique close relations. Uh, sometimes I joke and say, telling my Hindus, Hindu friends, we say, they are God, uh, uh, what's the Shiva, they are God. You see, Shiva, Shiva's, the Shiva deities, permanent residence is in Mount Kalesh, so the, what is it, the, uh, snow mountain in the western part of Tibet. So millions of Indian, you see, very sacred place in that mountain, snow mountain. And the rivers come from that, you see, the Ganga River, you see, the millions of people, Hindus, you see, they uh, annually come to that river and take bath. Uh, uh, that is purifying their sort of mistake or sins, like that. So, uh, we Buddhist, Buddha was Indian. So their deity, Shiva, since his permanent residence in, inside Tibet, so we consider he, him as a Tibetan.
<laughs> so India's <laughs> spiritual deities is Tibetan. <laughs> we Tibetan sort of spiritual sort of what's it, the uh, teacher, master, Buddha was Indian. <laughs> like that, some, some special connections there. And then, of course, the, I think the, uh, the politically also, you see, Tibet is just the next sort of as a neighbor. So therefore, the, uh, since the late 50s, 59, uh, the Indian leaders, you see, look very seriously about Tibet like that. So we have some very, very, very unique sort of relations. That also one factor. And then Indian, I think Indian tradition generally, you say, always is a welcome because of the foreigners as a guest. So they, 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 that kind of a tradition also there. So like that. I want to move to the subject of education. So when you think about educating the children... From some question from the... From the rest of the people, no. Oh, when we, we should manipulate way. Manipulate some way. Manipulate, oh. <laughs> you have no right <laughs> to ask questions. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> yes, oh. When you move to uh, the I think if time permits, I think I think you should ask us some, a few, few questions. I agree. Hmm? I totally agree with oh, you. Oh, yes. So you, you what, what do you think? What do you think? Yes, yes. This, welcome some question there. Oh, so now, what is the majority now? No? She would, you, you agree. One, two, three, <laughs> me also. I think we unanimously now. Aha, we overthrow no? the yes, dictator. Over. <laughs> we overthrow the dictator. <laughs> <laughs> Non-violently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can, can I ask a question about yes, education? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you start. Then I think uh, from the from the audience some questions. So. Um, when you think about educating the children of the world for the 21st century, what is the most important lesson we can learn from the Tibetan people and the Tibetan traditions? I think that uh, I am not that simple. Not that simple. Uh, many occasions I express, I think we need uh, some highly educated and experienced sort of educationist, and as well as some, I think, psychologist, some social worker, some concerned people uh, and who have real sort of wisdom and experience and uh, sort of study, research work. What is the best way? You see, to teach in school from kindergarten up to university about moral ethics or compassion, these things. Not uh, as a subject of religion, but simply in order to be happy human being individually, happy family, happy community. I think something we are lacking, uh, generous on the modern education subject, simply, you see, how to, how to, how to make oneself rich. Uh, not, not, I think not pay much attention about how to develop inner peace. Mm. So that, I think, part responsibility is to put on religious group, religious institution. Mm. So now the religious institution also, you see, their influence decline. Mm. So then nobody take care about spiritual sight, moral ethic sight. Mm. But I think, I don't think, you see, we can say, oh, we have some sort of experience to tell world, because oh, of world younger generation. No. That's unrealistic. I think in the last century we have put a lot of focus in educating just the mind, you know, the logic yes. and the rationale. And um, we have, it's been an age of technology. That's right. And we have developed uh, weapons that can destroy the world. That's right. Uh, While well, technology is marvellous, I mean, I love the internet. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but they, we have developed really things that are, are, are horrible and destructive, and the vast amount of our best brains mm. and our money goes into yes. militarism and war and, and nuclear weapons, yes. which are no use to us. That's right. So I think that because we've divorced the head from the heart, that we haven't made wise decisions. 
Um, uh, so we need to kind of try to find the balance. I think if we educate the heart, uh, because people are heart people. Our, our, our emotions are very important yes. and part of us, our feelings. Uh, but if we can kind of start looking at our education systems where we try to educate the heart uh, and how we young people, when they come into school, instead of rushing to teach them the three R's, writing, arithmetic, and, and, and uh, reading, I mean, could we not look at giving our little children right from the beginning a time in which they learn to deal with their inner emotions of fear and insecurity, mm -hmm. and where they learn how to, uh, to make friends, uh, and then that the, 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 the more serious thing can come as well. But to me, we need to somehow be able to combine the head and the heart mm -hmm. so that our best intelligence, but we bring the heart and wise decisions to it. Mm -hmm. So we really need to revisit the whole educational system uh, and starting also in the home, of course, where all education starts, but through the educational system itself. And I think then that would help us bring cool. about a more yes. humane society and hum humane world. Cool. من در این کتابی خوندم که بزرگترین سفر انسان از مغز به قلب شه. I read in a book that the biggest journey of a person is from the head to the heart. No. و یعنی اون چه که ما دانشی که اندوختیم بایستی با احساسات انسانی خودمون آمیختش بکنیم که به توانه برای مردم مفید باشه which means we have to the knowledge we've accumulated we have to find a bond between that and our emotions so that it could be useful to the people و این سفری نیست که در بزرگی بشه انجامش داد باید از کوچکی یاد بدیم چگونه این سفر اتفاق بیفته and this is not a journey that you can teach adults it's a journey that you should teach from when they're children to when they become adults من شخصا بسیار موافقم که اخلاقیات و معنویات جز دروس بچه ها باشه I personally believe that ethics and morality should be part of the curriculum of schools. الان جوان های خیلی از جوان ها رو می بینیم که فقط تنها هدفشون تو زندگی این است که موبایلشون رو شیکتر بکنن یا کامپیوترشون رو هر هفته هر شش ماه یه بار عوض بکنن. We see many young people whose main concern these days is to have a new cell phone or mobile phone or have the latest computer. And this is what they're learning from going to school. That means competing against each other and greed, wanting more. و این آموزش غلط آموزش درست این است که ما اون سفر بین مغز تا قلب رو بینا یاد بدیم that is the wrong education the right education is to show them the journey from the head to the heart اگر یه بچه اگر یه جوانی اینو یاد بگیره بقیه مسائل زندگیش رو خودش میتونه حل کنه and when a young person learns that he or she can resolve all the other problems that he has. Absolutely. <laughs> With time, you have to go. 2.30. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. So should I do a question? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, yeah, are there any questions from the audience on the subject? And the subject is, um, how do we deepen our understanding of the contributions of the Tibetan people to the world over the past 15 years? Anybody have a question on that subject? Yes. Um, Your Holiness, it's a great honor to be here today. Thank you for everyone who organized the opportunity to listen in on this uh, interesting conversation. So thank you for that. 
Uh, there's a, a question about the importance of host government and the ability for the Tibetan people in exile uh, to foster their culture has been dependent on host governments, India and Nepal. And I wonder if you could comment on um, the role that Chinese influence is having on host governments. Um, specifically in Nepal, there's been some suggestion that uh, the Chinese are asking the Nepali government to do certain things. And, and I just wonder if you could elaborate on whether or not it's a concern you have going forward uh, if Chinese pressure might uh, kind of, uh, force host governments to change their policies. That's a political question. Mm. Of course, obviously, uh, the, uh, I said the totalitarian regime sort of pressure everywhere, <laughs> even in the United States also. <laughs> so I think both India and Nepal receiving some special blessing from Peking. <laughs> That's quite clear. Uh, but then uh, Nepalese government, uh, say, uh, uh, the situation overall in Nepal, not very settled, not very sort of stable. stable. It's a lot of problems. So the uh, Chinese pressure, uh, Chinese communist pressure, you see, uh, more effective. Like that. Next question. Thank you very much. Um, you've uh, spoken today about um, change in the 21st century and um, I think there's been much change and involvement in the Tibetan community in exile and I have great admiration for that and I think that it's a great lesson for the world how you have evolved from a theocracy to a democracy and how the inclusion of women in your community and um, do you see, and in terms of this change that's going on in the, the 21st century that you've been referring to, do you think that is about the inclusion of women? Do you think that women are going to be a, a larger part of the dialogue and the shaping of the future of the 21st century? Give me a No. That, uh, I always is appealing uh, as the people You know, uh, my basic sort of thinking is, uh, basic idea is, uh, uh, I think the uh, 100,000 years ago, the human being, human community, a very small number, and they all worked together. Uh, at that time, I don't think the idea of leadership uh, then eventually population increase and some uh, unhealthy things will say happen or killing or stealing or rapes or these things will happen. So then eventually the uh, people realize necessary uh, leadership. Uh, suppose who lead a more just society like that. Uh, but sometimes the leadership themselves <laughs> they lead the wrong way. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's the idea. Is to come from uh, the idea of leadership. Is come come from. Then at that time, no education, no rule of education. So therefore, the physical strength is the main sort of condition or quality of the leadership. So male dominance come through that way. Uh, then eventually education uh, now uh, start uh, and important role of education. Uh, then that makes more equal female, male. Now not only that, as uh, uh, you mentioned, the you know, journey to head to heart. Uh, so the, uh, now we really need more emphasis, importance of uh, compassion, of forgiveness, these things, in order to build more harmonious society, more happy society, where fear should not there, distrust should not there. 
So the only remedy, remove, re, remove distrust, suspicion, fear, is compassion. If you treat other compassionately, sincerely, truthfully, then no basis of fear, no basis of distrust, no basis of suspicion. Uh, so compassion, loving, comp loving kindness, compassion, these things are foundation of happy human society. Uh, this itself, uh, nothing to do with religious faith. All religious faith supposed to be built with that value. Uh, so therefore, now, 21st century, we really need, we already discussed, we already touched, the, we need special effort for promoting this inner value. Uh, universal way, universal way. Uh, universally acceptable, not, not uh, without religion, religious faith, then, you see, it becomes narrow, or this religion, that religion, that religion. So we usually call secular way. And now here, the biologically, female have more sort of sensitivity about others' pain. I think most killer human history Sometimes very, very big name, hero, but actually killer. Most of them male. I think two per, I mean, two, one person you see dying. Two persons witness one male, one female. There's more chance the female go to help. The male may remain like that. So this is biological factor. We, everybody is born from our mother. Uh, our father, I think sometimes, I think very sincere, devoted father, but sometimes enjoy uh, <laughs> themselves, then forget all the responsibility. <laughs> Male, no. Oh, female, no. Till, you see, their child, you see, become more independent. Because of that, much pay attention. So like that. So therefore, now time is come. Female who have biologically more potential to bring affection, compassion on human society, in humanity. Therefore, women should take more active role regarding promotion of uh, human deeper value, compassion. So that's my view. So therefore, uh, I uh, recently, I, I mentioned uh, at our meeting, or oh, some people may call me feminist. So that, that's, the, uh, that's the basis. Like that. <laughs> this is uh, this sort of comment, not sort of appeasing these three casa, <laughs> female Nobel laureate. Mm. In public talk in France or in America, in many, many areas, I publicly appear like that. Very quickly. Well, I think, I think women will, are very, very important, as His Holiness has said, and deepening the compassion. But I think if, if it's really to be changed, that women have to bring a new agenda to the fore. I mean, the agenda is of mostly militarism and war and nuclear weapons. And, uh, and I think if women can change the policies and human security must move away from this idea of militarism into human security being people having enough food, houses, education, health care. And if this is the agenda that women are bringing out for new policies, then they can bring real change. But if they just go down the old road with the old policies of doing the old way and become even more militaristic, uh, uh, then that is not going to work. But I think also, too, women have to be very careful because uh, the, the most important thing is that we find our own inner peace and that we find our roots and our community. And women uh, are, are, are very happy when they are in their roots, in their community, in their family. 
uh, and they have to find a balance in their lives because you can't have everything in life. You know, you can't, you have to make choices and women have to make the choices that they find their own inner peace and that their families are happy. Because there's a recent report brought out in England where they did research amongst young children and young children were reporting they've, so for some of them they've never been so unhappy because they don't know where their mothers and their fathers are. Because this pressure now on women to have careers, to be everything, they're being pulled apart. And society is not ready yet to help this new evolving of women into the political and, and, and front because they don't have the backup. Maybe their, their partner is not the one who's going to be there when they're not, or uh, the, the, health, the, the, the governments are not providing enough health care. So women are in danger of being pulled apart uh, and, and not being happy and not being fulfilled. So I really think that as we move forward for women to come more to the front, that women have serious choices to make and that they and society be somehow developed to allow them to, yes, do what helps them be fulfilled, but above all helps them to meet the needs of their families and the compassionate, loving thing that a mother brings to a family which after all is a beautiful thing to be able to do. So it, it's, it's a very difficult situation for women and it's not easy. It, it is a very difficult choice that we all are given to, to how we go forward in today's society. I don't know. Whether, you know. Yeah, I agree totally, Maureen. I think that one thing that we have to do in today's world is stop thinking about what women talk about as being women's issues. It's human issues. We, the, the concerns of our planet are the concerns of everyone, whether we're men or women. You know, some of the diseases, it doesn't matter if I'm a man or a woman, I can get the disease. It doesn't matter. If a nuclear bomb drops, it's men and women who die. Militarism takes money away from education, health care, housing. So it is women taking a lead in setting a new agenda of human values and human issues, not women issues. And I agree with you fully about the need for compassion, secular training in school. I think part of the response to the conundrum you talk about, the pulling apart, is because there's too much emphasis on greed, money, education for the ability to make money. But if we are able to look at education more holistically with a teaching of compassion and societal value, it will be easier to support human beings in all of the choices they make, whether it's a woman to stay home or a man to stay home with his children. But it takes all of that and a new agenda, and I think women will be in the forefront of setting that agenda. I think men are too afraid to connect their head to their heart. Uh, what causes discrimination against women is not religion. It is the patriarchal culture that doesn't accept equality of human beings. When I say patriarchal, I don't, I'm not referring to the male and to the masculine gender. I'm, I'm talking about a culture that doesn't accept equality of human beings. چون این فرهنگ برابری انسان ها رو قبول نداره نه تنها به زن ستم میکنه بلکه دموکراسی رو هم نمیتونه تحمل بکنه and because this culture doesn't believe in equality not, uh, not only it has no respect for women it can't tolerate democracy either کشورهایی که وضعیت دموکراسی در اون بهتره وضعیت 
زنها به نسبت بقیه کشورهای غیر دموکراتیک بهتره In countries where democratic situation is more improved, women have a better situation than a non-democratic situation. Yes, that's right. Men, uh, 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 Although the women are victims of a, such a culture, they're also responsible for reproducing and creating and raising this culture as well. We must not forget that every man who is a bully has been raised by a woman. <laughs> I think a patriarchal culture is like hemophilia. In yet no bimaris ke hemophilia is a blood like, disease. Blood like disease. In yet no bimaris ke yek kharosh kuchak mitune monjar be zakhm be khonizi ziyadi beshe. Hemophilia is a disease when a, a little wound can oh. cause much blood. Blood disease. In yet bimaris genetic ye. It's a genetic disease. Yes, right. و زنها این ژن بیمار رو به اولاد پسرشون میدن. And this is a disease that is carried by women and it's uh, the women are carriers and it's given to their sons. یعنی زنی که این ژن بیماری رو داره خودش بیمار نمیشه، اولاد دخترش هم بیمار نمیشه، اما اولاد پسرش رو بیمار میکنه. So a woman who suffers from this disease of hemophilia, she doesn't suffer from it. Her daughters don't, but The sons are the only ones who carry this disease from the mother. بنابراین اون چی که برای ما مهمه اینه که زنها رو آگاه بکنیم به این فرهنگ غلط. So it's important that we make the women aware of this wrong culture. و اشکال مختلف عملکرد این فرهنگ غلط رو نشون بدیم. And we can show them the different ways of, the, of uh, impact of this wrong contact. And if we resist this culture, if we struggle against it, then we can see we can have the uh, equal rights in any religion and in any culture. <laughs> Your Holiness, we are, we are out of time uh, because these two have to go to the airport. Mm -hmm. I would like to present you with this gift on behalf of us, um, to you, a small gift. Um, thank, you. Mm -hmm. thank you for your support of Kishem and all of our programming here.